Okay, everybody, I am really excited today because I am joined by Sarah Sokolovich from Big Little Lies, who plays Tori. And you also might have seen her in Homeland as Laura Sutton, and she's done many plays as well and other feature roles in television. Sarah, how are you today? Oh, hi, Steve. I'm good. What a sweet introduction, and thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. You've, you've done right by me, as many of my um, former teachers have not oh, in the past. Thank God. Basically, people, people have been butchering my name since I was a wee little child. So. Yeah. Out of, <laughs> out of anything I was most nervous out of in this interview was pronouncing your last name right, so I'm happy I have passed that <laughs> test. <laughs> um, so I wanted to address the big elephant in the room. And oh, yeah. when I did research on you as a person, uh, oh. is it true that you worked at a zoo before you acted? Oh, yeah. yeah I, I did, actually. Yeah, my first job that I ever had was at the Milwaukee County Zoo. Mainly I worked in guest services, so it was like taking money for parking and renting strollers that were shaped like dolphins. And a tra occasionally I got to be the um, train conductor. Like there's a little train that runs through the zoo, so I'd sit in the last car and tell kids to keep their arms in the windows and not throw rocks. But really, there were, there were generally, like, no animals involved with my work <laughs> at the zoo. Um, but I do, I do really love animals. I actually wanted to be a vet when oh, I was okay. a little kid. Okay, mm -hmm. so you weren't, like, the position at the zoo that if a gorilla got out of line, you had to make the decision of whether to put it down or not? Yeah, no. Like, once I worked at the giraffe encounter, which I I loved because I love giraffes. They're so regal. But I think basically I was just, like, selling tickets, and they got to take a picture with the giraffe or feed them or oh, something. Wow. I don't remember that too well. But, I do. I, yeah, there was no animal handling in so, my job at the zoo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so how, in your life, like, did you know then, like, you're someone who loved animals, you're working at the zoo, but then were you fitting in acting on the side here. When did you start getting interested in actress? Is this something that's been with you since like a childhood? I mean, I, you know, I wanted, I was really, I wanted to be a lot of stuff as a kid. I remember there was a stint where I wanted to be an astronaut. I really wanted to be a journalist for a while. Actually, I almost went to school to study classics like Latin, Greek, um, dead languages. Um, being an actor is kind of perfect though if you stick around long enough you can play at a lot of different things without the high stakes of the actual job hey, right i don't i don't think it actually hit for me until maybe i was in my 20s i i started doing community theater when i was about 16 before that i think i'd done like one walk on in a play as a small child um but what i loved about theater was the community that I found, I think I had a hard time feeling like I fit in everywhere else. Right. Um, I was bullied a fair amount in school, like not mm -hmm. like a lot of people are. Mm -hmm. And I was a really, really, really shy, shy kid. I had a hard time putting words to my thoughts and my feelings. And my theater friends that I made were from all walks of life. And they loved me just the way that I was. I had, um, I'd had some dance training. I loved dancing because you didn't have to sort of talk to express yourself. So I did a ton of theater anywhere I could. And then um, I think I got my first professional gig when I was probably about 19. Did a bunch of regional theater, moved to New York, did more theater anywhere I could. And then I auditioned and got into Yale, Yale School of Drama when I was about 28. Right. But I, I can't say I know exactly when and where I committed to the idea of acting as a profession, even though I'd been getting paid to do it professionally since mm -hmm. I was pretty young. It was just part of my identity for, for so long. So Would you say then, when you say about bullying, and, and I think anyone in entertainment can relate to that, would you say that it was like a big benefactor too to like pushing you like towards acting and that acting became like this outlet for you and something that kind of healed that stuff you went through, that trauma in a way? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's hard to kind of un unpack the entire experience, but I really just loved, I'm one of those actors that loves the feeling of disappearing into mm. something, you know, and yes. in disappearing into something, you can also reveal a lot about yourself, I think, in a very 
safe way, but also in it, but it's even if it feels dangerous at the time, you know, to sort of tell your own personal truth through another person. Right. Um, yeah, it was just a really great, it was the perfect, it was sort of the perfect thing for me. I got to express myself and I was with a lot of other different kinds of people that, you know, probably also didn't fit in everywhere else. And, um, yeah, it was just sort of, it was just the happiest accident of my life right. that I happened to, you know, stumble into doing yeah. community theater. Sometimes it's funny, but honestly, I was probably the happiest that I had ever been in my entire life doing, doing like a community theater musical. <laughs> it was so much fun. There was yeah. no paycheck involved, you know, everybody just rolling up their sleeves and have to put the show on and all ages, all types. Um, ethnicities, uh, sexual orientations. It's just, you know, I really, I really just felt like it was, I I belonged there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's, that's awesome, Sarah. And saying that now about like community theater and you have such a strong background in theater. I'm curious, how was that transition then when you first started doing television or film and just the differences and challenges you kind of face between the different types of acting in a way? Well, yeah, I mean, I've I've been lucky that I've had a fairly prolific career in the theater. I mean, I've done so many plays and musicals. I, I notice that I've been given a lot more opportunities to do wildly different parts, like you mm-hmm. said, on stage. And um, so hopefully that'll carry over into my camera work, some more diversity. I've gotten to do a lot of different kinds of stuff on camera already. But um, for me, there's some big technical differences I mean, there's things that you can get away with vocally on camera that might not carry well on stage, depending on the space that you're playing. And there's things that you can do physically on stage that might not work for film or TV, depending on what kind of film and television that you're doing. With film, there's more opportunities to improvise than I've gotten with Mm. the theater, which sort of theater sort of requires you to be specific with your consistencies to keep a show intact for a long run. And then there's prep. I mean, in preparation for a play, you have the luxury of rehearsing for a long period of time and then previews and then performance after performance to explore. But, you know, transitioning from that experience to the film and TV experience, I have to say, finishing a take on film and then getting to walk away from it is totally satisfying for someone (laughs) who's a ridiculous perfectionist. It's been really, really good for me. And um, I'm not very precious about my choices. I can kind of do something and then let it go. I don't need to go back to the same thing all the time, but I find myself to be even less precious about my choices on camera. And I think, you know, film and TV is sort of the undiscovered country for me right now there's Mm -hmm. still like so much that I want to accomplish there and I'm having such a great time with my camera work but at the end of the day you know you choose I choose work based on writing if I Mm -hmm. love the writing then all I feel like I have to do is mine the text and I'm taken care of I love a challenge yeah you know I love I love a big challenge so so if I were to do you know another theater piece I think I would want it to be something that I could really, really fail at, you know, something that Mm -hmm. I've just never done before. Right now, I have no idea what that would look like because I've just had so much experience in the theater. So, but but I'm open. I'm open to be, to being surprised. Sure. And I would say you're a very versatile actress and it's already so impressive. You've been nominated for award in theater and nominated for award in Homeland for TV. So having said that, getting nominated for these big awards how did that affect your perspective of yourself as an actress? Does it like alter your ego in a way? And is it good? Is it bad? Would you say? Well, well yeah, I was. So there was a, a Drama Desk Award Best Featured Actress in a Musical for The Shags at Playwrights Horizons, and that was kind of crazy. I really wasn't expecting it. You know, the I think the nominations come out like a year. They came out like a year after I had actually done the musical. And then for Homeland, we were nominated as Best Ensemble for the Screen Actors Guild Awards. And personally, I think I felt more comfortable being part nominated as part of an ensemble because I just have this weird thing about 
being singled out of a group because I just know how hard everyone works. And I remember that when I was nominated as a single performer, I tried to think about it as being the opportunity, as being given to talk about the work that we all did collectively. Mm. And I think, you know, being nominated for things, it's really nice. It gets you some attention and attention gets you on lists Mm. and lists can get you into rooms that you haven't been in before or rooms that are just like impossible to get into. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the end of the day, you know, the great reward for me is the job. It's just all about getting to do the work. So I try to, I try to think about it more like that versus looking at it like, you know, you're singled out because you were the the best, you know, the best of the best. I try to think about it as, oh, wow, this is great. This is another opportunity for me to get get more opportunities to do what I love. So that's what you say that too. And like saying about you get put more on lists and more opportunities kind of arise from that. But also I was wondering with that, I'm sure it comes a little more pressure. Did you have a moment where you felt a lot of pressure for the first time in your life as you went up the ladder, like any certain auditions or where you kind of felt that change? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Yes is the short answer. I think I think I've always struggled with anxiety. Mm. Auditions are terrible situations to be put sure. in sometimes. Sure, sure. I tr- I try to look at them as just an opportunity to act and just an opportunity to show, you know, my ideas and what what I can do r- really well, but they're very they're very hard. I mean, like you're, you're often not given very much time at all to prepare for these things, especially if, you know, you, you're at the level that I've been at for most of my life. You, you have, you know, maybe if you're lucky 48 hours to prepare, you know, a week is a luxury and that's actually not a lot of time for an actor to prepare for a role. So it's always been a challenge for me to go into the room and not feel like I'm taking a test and the test is how well do I know my lines. Mm. So once I can kind of get past that sort of roadblock, most of the time it's just about whatever I'm, you know, whatever love I'm bringing into the room with me, which Mm. I know sort of sounds hippie, but you know, the love for that character, the love for the story, the love for the work of the people that I'm in the room with auditioning but it's surprising, though, you know, some of the big ones, some of the really big ones, like the Homeland audition, for for example, I just really thought that character was fun. I really felt like I understood it in a very instinctive way. Sure. And the, you know, I was meeting with the executive producers. It was a big deal. I was the only person called that day. So mm-hmm. it was like a very private meeting with me. And when I walked in, I think... I wasn't really aware of how big a deal it was. I certainly didn't know that they were going to take that tape and make it a test for the network. I I didn't know any of that. And so in some ways it actually worked for me because I could relax a little bit. And I remember when I talked to Alex Ganza, the executive producer, after, you know, when we were in Berlin, he said, oh, you were just so beautifully confident. And I thought, God, that's so funny because I don't, I just don't. I, I don't really remember it like that. I remember that I was a little nervous, but that I just really loved that part. And so I think I try to let the, you know, the love that I have for, you know, getting to act and that role come out more. I try to have that featured in the foreground right, versus right. whatever anxiety is kind of happening underneath. Oh, okay, that's that's awesome that you do that. And it sounds like you're very deep in thinking. And I think that... I, I wonder... Not always successful, though. Yeah. <laughs> not always successful. Definitely not. I've certainly had a lot of face plants when it comes to auditioning. And sometimes it's like, I'm pretty shy, and so I have that nervous talking thing. And sometimes people just find it adorable in the room, and sometimes it, it probably just makes me look like a total idiot. But, you know, whatever. So, so you say you're pretty shy, too. So would you, would you put yourself in that category? Because a lot of comedians, a lot of actors, too, like people don't realize you meet them in person and a lot of them are shy it's a oh yeah it's a normal thing and like but you're able to like turn something on when you're on a stage or in a set it's almost like all that I guess self-confidence that you've kind of suppressed in your life comes out there I I feel like I can even relate to that when I'm just doing my videos and it's like 
Would you say though you're just naturally a shy person and you can but you do have a switch you can like kind of come out of it? Yeah, I think um you know for me it's all it's all in the it's all just I put all of all of the work into the the character. And I'm not really one of those actors that like, I'm not super, you know, I, I hate using the word method, but mm-hmm. I'm not that actor that needs to sort of be in character the entire time mm-hmm. on the set. But you do sort of change your focus a little bit so that the things that can kind of trigger your anxiety, like all of the people, um, the chaos that's happening around you, um, you know, just trying to, you know, recall your lines effortlessly, all of the things that could make you nervous. I really just try to focus on the character, what they're there to do that day in the scene, what they're pursuing. I try to put it all into that and, and just kind of recognize, you know, the, the little monsters in your head, the little anxiety is just little gremlins that are running around the room. You know that they're there, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but you're not going to pay any attention to them. Right. My friend Vicky actually put it to me that way once she said you just gotta picture them as gremlins like they're out there they're running around they're doing their thing but you're not going to pay attention to them right now yeah. you're just going to focus on what your job is i like that your friend vicky's yeah. very smart uh yes she is okay so switching gears now to big little eyes obviously the show that is huge on hbo you play tori on it obviously now when you got cast in such a big show as big little eyes did you know right away when you got this part that it what exactly it was and who was actually in the show? I did know. I I remember that when I auditioned, I knew who was attached that had been attached thus far. Mm. And I don't know. I think when you get things like that, I mean, there's been so many. I, I've been really fortunate that I've gotten to audition for some really high profile stuff. I mean, my, my team has just worked so hard for me, and, mm. which is lucky. Like I knew that there were some really huge people involved Mm -hmm. and I just looked at it like, oh, well, this would be just so great to get, you know, to get to be a part of, but it didn't, um, it didn't like totally freak me out. I mean, I had had the fortune of working with a lot of really huge actors already and in a really deep Mm -hmm. and intimate way. I mean, there was Homeland, you got Claire Danes, number one, who's like a total class act. Um, F. Murray, friggin' Abraham, Mandy Patinkin, uh, John Turturro had directed me as an understudy in a Broadway play, and I mean that right there just checks off a lot of people in you know that are on the please let me work with in some capacity <laughs> Hell yeah. bucket list. Yeah, and I did a play in De- in New York City called Detroit with um, John Cullum, Darren Petty, David Schwimmer, and Amy Ryan, and it was a huge role a coveted role and i i absolutely loved it and i remember that when we read through the play for the first time amy turned to me at the end of it and of all the things she could have done or said in that moment the first thing that she said was you are just fantastic and wow what a gift i mean i I felt like oh okay i actually do belong here i do have a job to do that i can do well because once you hear that from you know someone who's an idol. And she right. absolutely is. She's truly an idol of mine. She's a total genius. She can do anything. That just, those experiences stay with you forever. So right. I remember like thinking, oh, this is just an incredible opportunity. Right. And this would be really cool to get. But, you know, I've, I've worked with, they're all just actors. And if they're yes. actors worth their salt, they're there to show up and just get the work done and just do a good job. And they are, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so, they're really committed to what they're doing. So So it sounds like you were already like prepared to even just be like, Okay, yeah, my scene partner in this scene is Reese Witherspoon and you had enough almost veteran acting experience around other big name actors and actresses and uh I think that's really cool how you just put that there that again too, everyone's there to do their job and, and I feel like too, like when you're in a scene in example, Big Little Eyes with Reese Witherspoon, you're able, right, to zone in and just almost forget that it's even Reese Witherspoon, realize it's Madeline, and eventually you just almost are like, oh, we're all on the same team here. I'm assuming that's how you feel on set with them. Yeah, I mean, there's always, there. yes, there's always, a there is a moment here or there of, oh, my mm. God, this is crazy, but really, it's a job, and if you made it to where you are, then you have to just focus on the job, because ultimately, 
your scene partner needs you. And I work just really hard at just trying to be a great scene partner, just be a great assist, you know, do your homework, listen well, stay flexible, be present, because that's the real gift that you can give to the process. Okay, so with a character now like Tori, to mm-hmm. me, watching it and seeing you on screen, I always thought in the back of my head, like, man, this must be a tough part to play because to the audience, it's a very mysterious character, especially when you just come in. And all we really know about you is that you're Joe's wife in the beginning and that you got your eye on Madeline. So when you're going in as the actress of this character, are you creating a whole backstory for her in your head? Are you on, like, kind of sync with the writers about this? Or is there, like, a little loose thing you got there that's just open i i don't know how to exactly say that but oh yeah what do you no, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's so funny you say that she's in, it's like she's not a mystery to me because i know all her secrets sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> like evil laugh um <laughs> no but tori is like tori is a great what i affectionately have referred to in my life as a ninja role you know mm. she just gets in there she slices some folks up and she gets out and mm. Sometimes those are just the, my favorite parts because I feel a lot of liberty to play, create things in my mind that maybe the audience will only ever see pieces of what makes this person. But my theory is if you really do your homework, the audience might not always get the specific full picture of exactly what they're seeing from you at every moment, but mm. they'll hopefully see a really rich three-dimensional person with a full inner life who arrives at an inevitable moment in their lives. That's always my hope anyway. And usually if someone uses the word mystery, it means they want to know more about the thing they're talking about. So I'll take it. That's that's very flattering. Do you, though, with that character, when you're on set and you're like, okay, this is my script for the character, are there moments where you do go to like the director or writer and be like, hey, hey, so can you give me a little intel where Tori's headed? Or, or do they just... Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you never really know much of anything ahead of time mm-hmm. on, you know, in TV, or at least I, I've never been in the position where I have. Like, you know, with the show and with Homeland, it's, uh, you know, everyone's kind of on spoiler alert, so sure. they don't really want to tell you too much ahead of a time. Uh, ahead of time. Um, I do speak up if something really and truly doesn't make sense to me at all, but, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of the nature, nature of the beast, but that can be okay. I always look at it as, if you don't have more than a few pages to go on, you just tell the truth of the moment in the moment mm. as it is on the page, and you trust that it will all unfold as it's meant to. I mean, Fascinating. No one, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition, right? I hope the kids listening are listening to this. This is great <laughs> advice. Uh, so now when you first read the part of Tori, did you have any characters you played in theater or on screen before that you kind of connected to Tori and maybe helped you get into the mindset of her character? Or was it something totally brand new to you as a character? Totally. You know, she's pretty freshly baked. Mm. She's totally a new one for mm. me, or I look at her that way. But maybe that's why she's so fun. I will say, ironically, just as a sidebar, when we were filming season one, the big Audrey Elvis party scene, near the end of the season, Beyonce had just dropped Lemonade. And my God, it could not have been more perfect timing. Number one, I'm a huge Beyonce fan, but (laughs) it was was like the perfect soundtrack to sort of have in my head as that character. I remember, I think back to the, the audition and season one and how there wasn't much time to prepare. So you sort of have to respond to what speaks to you viscerally trust your instincts, your first impressions. And I remember that one of the audition scenes was the scene where Tori confronts Madeline at the opening night party for Avenue Q, which um, Joseph, my husband, directed. Mm. And that really spoke to me. That felt very unique because not every person would do something like that. That's a very specific human being Mm. confronting a, a private issue in a public space and I just saw her as a decent, kind, honest person who loves her husband and was just wanting the truth, despite whatever pain she was going through, whatever answer she was going to get. And I I often wonder what that scene would have looked like if Madeline would have just told her the truth. Because, I mean, Tori doesn't walk up to her and say, you know, 
a bunch of expletives. She gives her the opportunity to just be authentic in the moment with her, and she asks her, was it you? And that's a super vulnerable thing to do. And shortly after that, uh, I was cast. I, I had a, a costume fitting, and it was actually the designer, Alex, who offered up that they were kind of thinking of Tori as someone who was not as moneyed as everyone else, that she and Joseph were sort of newer to the area. And just that little piece of information, I mean, it really lit me up. I thought, oh, wow, okay, great. So she's married to an artist. Maybe Tori's also an artist. Her clothes are kind of worn in and comfortable, very bohemian style. I think the car I drove was like an old Saturn. Yes, Um, yeah. (laughs) You know, lower economic standing. And then all of that kind of, becomes pieces of a puzzle. Then, you know, you think about how she probably felt like a bit of an outsider, Mm. no real strong sense of community, maybe not in the way that Joseph had, maybe no strong friendships, maybe her confidence was suffering because she wasn't as rich and popular as everyone else. And the scripts never spoke about children. So, you know, Mm. maybe they don't have any, maybe she deeply wanted them. And that also separates her from the rest of the community. So then you basically come up with this picture in your head, you know, warm, kind, decent person in a community, not totally comfortable in, pushed into a humiliating position. So in a last-ditch effort to get some clarity, move on from this, she confronts Madeline, and the response she gets is that she's treated as if nothing ever happens. Mm. You know, nothing's even happened. And now you've got a character who feels invisible, And Mm. I think that's a very human thing that many people can connect to. And then season two happens. (laughs) Sure, sure. And that that can just go like a thousand different ways that can motivate so many different outcomes for, you know, for future actions. I think that's a, a great setup. Sorry, yeah. that was really long. No, was no, really I was really enjoying that. That was excellent. That really, oh, I, no, I felt like it just went to the mind of Tori. I actually forgot I was interviewing you, and I thought I was talking to Tori for a second. But no, that was great. And I, I mean, I, yeah, and I think that's what makes her character so interesting. And how, like, when we meet her in season one, she really is one of the only true to me victims in the show, and we've oh, only sure. seen good from her. Where like everyone else, there's dirt, obviously, and there's a lot of gray. But I'm rooting for Tori. But then it's like I wonder, watching season two, like, hmm, I wonder where Tori's gonna go and if she's gonna be as likable as we move on. Um, I think that's very interesting. And um, I it's was so hard to tell. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's so with this show especially. I mean, it's 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 hard, it's hard to know. And, you know, I guess by definition, yeah, she's a, she's a victim in the sense that from what we've seen, she's sort of the casualty of some folks who chose to like blow up their lives. Sure. But I don't think, you know, I don't think she has that victim mentality. I think that what we've gotten to see from her so far is that she's working really hard at picking herself up and, and living a, a really full life. You right. know, that's the thing, though. I, I wonder with her is like because, you know, affairs and cheating, everyone has their different views on all this stuff. But oh, yeah, I, I, I wonder, like, is she a character? Would you say, Tori, if you're going to rank like how mad she is at Joe, her husband versus how mad she is at Madeline, because some people usually are just mad at their spouse for affairs. But some people actually take it, I think, more out on the mistress and they go slash their tires or something like where do you see Tori's like belief on that? Well, I will say that I don't think Madeline is her favorite person. Okay. <laughs> okay. So she's not like totally blind to the other person. Like she's not just oh, no. like so focused on the spouse, right? I right. think I think she kind of has the full the full picture. Okay. Of what's of what's going on. Okay, I like that. It's so <laughs> it's, it's it's like it's so funny. You don't want to like you know you don't want to say. I love give, having letting the audience just have th- as much of their own experience as they can watching this show. Mm-hmm. So it's like I even feel a little bad, you know, just for going into Tori's mind a no. little bit because I lo- I like that people will watch something and they'll just they'll just have their own, you know, completely own experience. They'll have their own feeling yeah. about, you know, what they're seeing. And to speak to what's aired this season, like in the first episode, mm-hmm. I mean, we just don't have enough time on the show for me to talk about how disarmingly mm-hmm. cool Adam Scott is. Sure, sure. And what he's just such a great guy. I just think the world of him. I mean, 
I will say I was nervous there because I just think he's really brilliant and I wanted to show up well for him. I wanted to be a really good assist. He's so much fun, so focused. And, oh, man, when you have moments on set, which are so chaotic and awkward and unnatural feeling for me still with all the people and the equipment and the start and stop, when you have someone as a partner who's just really tuned in like he is, ugh, it's it's gold. I yeah, mean, he, yeah. He made it so easy for me. And so, you know, it, I, I have to say that a lot of, that I found a lot of myself in, in, in working with Adam, you know, in that first, yeah, particularly in that first scene, because you show up, you have these ideas, but they, they really don't mean anything until you're with the director and your, your scene partner. So. Right. Now, that scene, too, made such a big stamp just even on social media and Twitter. Oh, did it? Yes, totally. Now, yeah. to be, you got to be like honest it. with me here. When yeah. that premiere is airing, are you, like, going on the couch, cooking up some popcorn? Nope. And wa- no. Okay. Nope. No. No. Okay. No. I'm, I'm, like, hiding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> doing something else. No, right. I don't. Okay. I really, like, it sounds bad not to offend anyone. No, I really no, no. don't. I don't watch. I no. really don't. Hey, that's nope. yeah. In the in the first season, I watched everything basically mm-hmm. that I wasn't in, and I watched the last episode, which I am in, but they don't. I don't really talk in it, so I figured okay. that that was fine. I'm just terrible at watching sure. myself. It's sure. bad. I can't ever. I've heard that Conan O'Brien has that has like the thing where he'll read something about himself and then he'll pick out the yes. one thing that's yes. really negative. Yes. And I. You know, I'll watch a scene and I'll think about like something physical that I have zero control over or yeah. how my voice sounds or whatever. And and I think, you know, if an experience means something to you, it's hard to then watch the videotape of what that experience was because Absolutely. they cut it and they use, you know, stuff that, you know, you might not have. It, I just I, I just stay out of it. Um I stay away from, from social media land just because it, it all freaks me out. Okay, yeah, because I was going to ask you that because that was one of the things I always notice when I'm like, oh, I like this actress or actor. I'll look them up on Instagram and Twitter. When they're not there, I think maybe I'm spelling the name wrong. Or, I'm like, no, there's no, no Sarah here. So, there's yeah, no is that, Sarah. that's a conscious decision. And is there like, are you anti-social media or is it just not for you? Yeah, I mean, I know the world's like deprived of my pictures of my homemade pies and my adorable <laughs> puppy dog. Um, no, I think I, like, I used to have all, I, I had most of that stuff. And I think I quit it when I realized, I mean, there were probably a lot of different reasons, but I think I quit it once I realized that if you post a picture, the company owns it forever. Oh, God, like, okay. <laughs> Even if you like delete it or delete your profile, and I didn't like that. I don't know if that's true anymore, so I don't want to, you know, speak badly about something that's not true. But the, I mean, the real answer is that it's just not my thing. I mean, yeah. I have, I have like no judgments at all toward most things, but toward definitely those who like and use social media. I think if it makes you feel happy and connected to the world, that's great. If it's a platform that you use to talk about the issues that you're passionate about, that's great. But it just generally freaks me out. I'm just a sensitive, like, shy person. And, I mean, I still refuse to get a Kindle and only recently (laughs) fully kind of moved all of my music into digital land. So I think maybe I'm just born in the wrong era. I've always threatened (laughs) to go back to a flip phone, but I, okay. uh, you know, but, but I need Uber occasionally sure. and, G- and GPS. I mean, no, I'm with you on so. there. I love the flip phone. I actually miss the flip phone. And, uh, I do too. Yeah. I do too. Don't you, isn't it great to think like nobody can email me? Yeah. I mean, I remember that all of my friends were getting cell phones when I was in high school and I, that my immediate thought about a cell phone was, Ugh, like, why would I want anyone yeah. to be able to call me sure. when I'm not at home? Yeah. And yeah. now it's like the thing. Like it everyone, is. you have to have a cell phone now. I mean, it's. I mean, even the kids in Big Little Eyes are on their iPads every episode. I know. Day, you know? I know. I know. It's crazy. But, yeah. You know, that's, and I think that's but smart. That's great. I mean, it's super helpful. I mean, sure. I had to go to a wedding once and like Yo- Yosemite, and I had to drive up there from Los Angeles, and okay. it was a huge drive, and I did it alone. I mean, I don't know what I would have done Without. if I didn't have my, you know, cell phone, if I didn't have my GPS. 
I mean, that would have just ended really bad. You know? <laughs> Sarah, I think you're selling yourself <laughs> short here. I think you'd be great with a map. I really do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just on a serious note, just um, I think it's so impressive, and I love seeing stories kind of like um, J.K. Simmons, and I think you're in this boat where you started getting big gigs later in your career as an actress. And oh, yeah. I think a lot of actors and actresses, when they get to a certain age, they start losing hope that they haven't got what they dreamed of or haven't ever got that big break or landed the big role. What would you say to those actors and actresses that feel like giving up at this point, that they're a little later in the game and it's not working? Is there some kind of encouragement you could give them? Yeah, I mean, when you say that, that hits me in a really like personal place. Mm -hmm. And I would say that, you know, if you're listening to this and you feel like giving up, I mean, you know, I'm pretty terrible at advice, but I can say that I, I can empathize because I actually feel like giving up a lot. Mm -hmm. And this is a really crazy time to be alive. It's a crazy time to be an artist and it's a totally crazy business. Mm -hmm. But if you're in this because you, know, you love to make art, you can do that anywhere at any time with no permission from anybody. So if that's true for you, then you've already won. Just go make some art. Um, but for your mental that. health, you know, for your mental health, separate your love of your art from the business. Right. You know, just the stuff that the stuff that is totally out of your control. And right. I, I put a little stock in luck. But luck's not really in my control. I put a lot of stock in hard work. And practically, I, practically, I, I think it's, it's probably a really good thing to know where you want to be geographically when the phone isn't ringing because that happens for everybody. You know, yeah. I'm a big advocate of just do, do what makes you happy. It all works out in the end. But, yeah, I really, I really do empathize with, with people that, are are not quite where they want to be. Did you ever see that um that documentary The Defiant Ones? No, I haven't. Oh my god, it's so good. Where is that? Uh, where can I watch that? HBO. Oh, okay. Not, that was totally not a plug. <laughs> just by chance. I see what you're doing, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not no 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 no. I got it. <laughs> just by chance. Yes. But it's it's really really incredible. And Jimmy Iovine says something incredible on it. He says, he talks about how he tells people that you have to, you have to think of it, think of your career like, oh, I'm going to butcher this. He says it so well, but he says, you have to think about your career like you're a horse with blinders on. You've got to run your own race. You can't look, you look to the side, you're going to run into the wall. You know, just, just wow. run your own race. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. There's room for the table at everybody. That's really what I believe. That is amazing. I'm definitely going to watch that now. And Sarah, I hope you write an inspirational book one day. I, I can't wait for it. No, <laughs> no way. There'd be too many ums in it <laughs> and nervous nerd laughter. That's what, that's what my inspirational like that. book would be, would be filled with. <laughs> so. Okay, so to wrap things up, Sarah, um, the question that's on everyone's mind, if you can answer it, will we see Tori again this season? And if not, will we see her in a future season? What Do you know anything about that? Oh, I think there's a pretty good chance that we're going to see Tori again. Yeah, All for right. sure. Awesome. Yeah. Um, is there anything you would like to promote at the current that's coming up? Any projects? Anything? Any theater? I would like to promote peace, kindness, and conservation. Oh, um, I... And I'll... I'll leave it with that. <laughs> that is beautiful. Sarah, that is just an amazing note to go out on. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so grateful you did this, and it is super awesome of you, and I'll never forget this. So thank oh, you so geez, much. That's so sweet. That's so sweet of you. We'll have to do it again. We'll yes, have to do it again sometime. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, for yes, sure. Yes, and everyone, please keep watching Big Little Lies. Make sure to share this interview wherever you can. And, yeah, leave a like down below and comment anything you thought about, anything you want to share to the discussion. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much. You're so welcome.